Hi, this is Josh Beiser from GameWisdom.com. Hope you enjoyed this critical thought, a detailed discussion on game design, and be sure to subscribe and you can pitch future critical thought topics. Okay, I have a quick critical thought for you today. For those of you watching this on April 24th, the sequel to the hit indie horror game Outlast 2 is now out. I'm sure there are already videos, streams, and Let's Plays already up from various people here and on Twitch, but I am not going to be one of those people. And for today's critical thought, I want to talk about why the Outlast series, and by extension a lot of indie horror games, just don't work for me. I can't do a simple rant video, it's got to be at least a 10 to 12 minute discussion. Now, when it comes to the indie horror genre, this has certainly exploded over recent years, thanks to Amnesia, Outlast, Five Nights at Freddy's, um, the slew of clones, spiritual successors, and homages to those respective games, and probably even more than I'm forgetting right now. And when it comes to the indie horror genre, it's been capitalized on removing Fight or Fright, and I know we've had a critical thought about this in the past, but Fight or Fright, of course, is the two psychological conditions that someone enters when they're being uh, pressured or feeling scared. Obviously, if you're going to fight, you're going to stand your ground and try to stop whoever's coming at you. If it's Fright, you're getting the heck out of Dodge. And when it comes to horror design, this is an important part of that horror experience, or bringing the audience into the world. Many horror movies and some of the most popular video games have of course put you in the shoes of regular people, and you're just sitting there having to ask, what would I do in this situation? And Fire Fright is a major part of that. But What's very surprising is how many horror games, especially of the indie variety in the last few years, have removed that essential element, in my opinion. In Five Nights at Freddy's, you're just sitting at a terminal for, I forget how many hours it is. The Outlast series, you're wandering around, able to hold a camcorder, but you don't have the sense to grab a crowbar or a 2x4 nearby. And so on and so forth. And there's a few problems that I have with this. The first is from an immersion point of view. Again, we had a really big podcast last week in terms of this recording when we talked about immersive sims and bringing the player into the world. And when it comes to the horror genre, fight or fright is an essential part of that. You can't tell me that a grown man who's in a scary situation doesn't have the ability to pick up a box or a chair or anything in the environment to wield as a makeshift weapon. Likewise, you can likewise if I'm supposed to be like a child and I don't have the options to, you know, crawl under beds or vents, or basically put myself in a place where an adult couldn't get me, that's also immersion immersive breaking. And when it comes to the horror genre of the indie scene, a lot of these games ask you make these very big leaps of faith in terms of its design. I mean, hell, we could spend 20 minutes listing all the narrative inconsistencies and gameplay consistencies of the Five Nights at Freddy's series alone. But the point is, if there is not that option, it makes it very hard to be scared because it creates a binary or um, trial, I'm sorry, uh, pass or fail kind of design, or trial by error, in a matter of speaking. The idea is because I don't have any options to play, I'm limited by whatever the designers want me to do, and any straying from that line immediately results in failure. And instead of making it about horror, it becomes about gaming the system. We talked about this the last time we spoke about Fire Fright, but Five Nights, Five Nights at Freddy's, regardless of which game the series, is a very easy game to break because it's all built on event triggers and following the pattern. If you've watched like someone like Markiplier when he's doing the, um, I forget the exact name, I think it's like the 2020 mode or the highest AI version of that play, he gets it down to an almost mechanical step-by-step uh, -step guide to playing it and he can beat that very easily because he knows how to exploit the AI at that level. 
but you never want to hear stuff like min-maxing or exploiting when we're in a horror situation. You're supposed to be making the player unease, and it's not supposed to be designed around breaking that. I talked about one of my favorite horror games, the Condemned series, and that's definitely going to be on the table for a dissecting design at some point. But that takes me to the other part of why I'm not playing Outlast 2 and the new piece for today's critical thought. Frustration versus fear. Frustration and fear are two complete opposites. You can't be feeling scared if you're feeling pissed off or annoyed at a game, and vice versa. And one of the things that has gotten to me about a lot of these indie horror games is that whenever I play them, I'm more frustrated about what I'm doing rather than being scared or pulled in. And going back to the idea of immersion, if the player is feeling frustrated with the game or annoyed at what's going on, then you've lost them from a horror experience. In Amnesia, it got to the point in one of the later parts that I was just so frustrated that I stopped giving a damn about the story or what's going on. And when that happened, the horror aspect is gone, and it's never going to come back. And the Outlast series in particular gets me with how it limits lighting. Now, for those of you who watch, I think, an earlier critical thought about quality of life or accessibility options, one of the things you want to avoid is making the player feel pain or, f or having trouble playing your game. And one of the things I've noticed about Outlast is due to how the night vision is very grainy and makes it very hard to see, and then the other option is just, you know, barely any light, I find those games tend to give me headaches if I play them for too long. And again, this is a simple fact or a simple reason is due to this design consideration. Now, if you haven't played Atlas and you know, or you don't know, I'm sorry, that a major part of the game is managing your light on your camera or your camcorder. And you have to hunt around for batteries in order to keep recharging it because you can't see otherwise. So what ends up happening is if you run out of batteries and you haven't made it far or further along to get more, then all you're left is just fumbling around the dark while enemies tend to seem to have perfect night vision. So what ended up happening in the first Outlast was I got about, I think, three quarters of the way done the game and I ran completely out of batteries. There was no way, there was no, none around, I couldn't do anything. And I was stuck in an area outside and I couldn't figure out how to get around because, of course, my vision is basically like this close to my face. And I had to just, you know, squint at my screen, try to make any semblance out of what's going on. And about 20 minutes of fumbling around like this, and I could feel the pressure of a migraine coming. And at that point, that was it. I just said, you know what? I don't give a crap anymore about Outlast. This game can go to hell for all I care. You know, I'm uninstalling it. And that, my friends, is a failure when it comes to horror. If the player is feeling frustrated at the design instead of being scared, I'm sorry to hear the phone in the background, then there is no way you're going to get them back. And in Outlast 2, I got very, I got similar to that almost 10 minutes into the play. What happened, of course, was I started playing, could barely see, I took a step forward, I fell off a cliff. And then, of course, I had to restart. And then when I got to the first encounter, I realized just what exactly was going on with this game. I could barely see what was happening, and then all of a sudden someone spots me completely out of my vision in the dark, follow, you know, chases me down, kills me in one hit. I reload, I turn on the camera again with the night vision, still could barely see, and while I was trying to wait and see how I could spot this person, I saw of course a little battery in the care starting to fade out, and that was when I realized that Outlast 2 is going to piss me off as much as Outlast 1, and no, I'm not going to be playing this game for two or three more hours to get to that frustration point. But, to wrap up today's critical thought, horror design is a very tricky line to balance. On one end, you want to make the player feel weak, or I'm sorry, one hand, feel weak and powerless, so that they are in a situation where they're going to be scared. But on the other hand, if the player gets to the point of feeling too weak or too frustrated, then your game has the opposite effect. It's going to make them annoyed and they're just going to give up playing. And it's not because they're scared, 
is because they just feel like, why should I you know, keep jumping through hoops for this game? And a major, again, going back to the idea of fight or fright, it's a very important point for immersion to give the player those options because that's how you would respond in real life. Again, if I'm in a situation where there's murderous cannibals all around me and I see, you know, knives and butcher cleavers and whatnot on the wall, I'm going to grab one of those. Yes, I'm not going to be, you know, a world-class fencer or trained in military action, but you don't need to be trained in self-defense to know how to swing a cleaver at some crazy person coming at you. And you can give the player power without making them feel powerful whether it's by limiting what they can do, or by presenting enemies who can match or maybe a little bit better than the player. Again, the Condemned series is such a brilliant example of giving the player power in the form of wielding any and all objects around them, but still making them feel powerless enough to get scared at the fact that they are facing deranged homeless people and more. For those of you watching this, what do you think about the recent trend of indie horror games? Are you like me and just get frustrated about them, or do you enjoy them? Again, I'm going to probably piss some people off, but I always chuckle when I watch YouTubers and streamers play these indie games like Five Nights at Freddy's and Outlast, and they're always like jumping around and getting scared by it. I did a stream of Five Nights at Freddy's, and for about 30 minutes, I almost fell asleep while I was trying to play that game. And another question, when it comes to horror, what do you think is that balancing point between power and powerless? How strong do you think the player's character should be to give them options of survival, but without going across or going over that line to making them a badass? Again, if you go too far with giving the player options, then you run into a situation like Batman in the Arkham City series. Again, no matter how many enemies outnumber Batman, it doesn't matter. He's freaking Batman. He's going to take them all out, and he's going to take them out in style. But on the other hand, you have games like Haunting Ground or Rule of Rose, where you are playing like a, I think it was like a 13 or 16 year old girl, and you barely have any control of what's going on, and it gets to the point of being frustrating instead of trying to scare the player. But with that said, we're going to wrap it up for today. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you're new, be sure to like and subscribe and pitch future critical thought topics. But otherwise, be sure to check back daily for, may for more great discussions on game design here and on GameWisdom.com. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoy it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. And of course, share with your friends. It always helps out. For daily posts on all manner of game design and industry topics, check out game-wisdom.com. To support the site and everything that I do, be sure to check out the Patreon campaign. If we can hit goals, it will mean more content for everyone to enjoy, and I'll be able to support myself and my household. If you want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter at GWBicer for updates throughout the day and random thoughts from me. And lastly, you can find me on Twitch right over there at GW Bicer for daily streams most nights around 10 Eastern. Thanks again for watching the video, and be sure to check out more great content coming to the Game Wisdom channel real soon.